We're going to be chatting a little bit about uh, serverless identity and security. And uh, the reason why I guess uh, I've been asked to do this is because I'm actually building serverless at Microsoft. So I work on the Azure Functions team, uh, working mainly on the identity, security, and extensibility features uh, that go into that product. Um, I'm going to keep this talk kind of vendor neutral. Like You can kind of apply most of this stuff to any serverless platform. Um, but just for the record, all my examples are going to be in using Azure Functions. Our logo is this lovely lightning bolt here. If you really like it, I have stickers. Um, but there's also other serverless products. Well, one of those things that always creeps up is people tend to think that serverless is just functions as a service, and that's not true. Uh, we actually have a whole serverless platform uh, at Microsoft, and of course other vendors do as well. Um, so things like Logic Apps and Event Grid are at play, but we're going to be mostly focusing on functions because that's what I know best. So, um, how many folks are familiar with serverless, feel good about it, feel like they really got a handle? Awesome. So this is going to be great. We're going to go through a quick kind of intro of what serverless is and why it has seemingly taken over Twitter. Um, and we're also talk a little bit then about the actual considerations for what happens when I need to actually put this thing into practice. So that's not good. Cool. All right. So we look at the history of cloud computing, and we see that we took things that were you know, on boxes that we own, and we said, I don't own these boxes anymore. I'm going to have a cloud provider on that box. And then we said, I don't actually want to think about the box too much. I just want to think about the application. So we need a platform as a service. Serverless is really just delivering on the platform as a service promise a little bit more, right? It's saying, I don't actually want to deal with the actual application server itself. I don't want to deal with anything that, you know, I might have to fiddle with knobs in a platform as a service offering. I just want to get my thing up and running. And so serverless is kind of a horrible name, and pretty much anybody in the serverless community will tell you that. Um, it turns out we don't just have empty warehouses that we call data centers. There are servers under the covers. The most important thing is that you don't actually have to care about them because the platform provider takes care of all that for you. So you're distracted away from it. That means rolling updates. That means um, you know all sorts of things around just even process isolation. So that um, when things like Spectre melt down, first rolled out, um, that first wave of things, there was no action that needed to be taken by anybody who was on a serverless platform. Right? It was already updated for you. Um, it's also an event-driven programming model when we're talking about functions, especially. Um, this is actually really important to serverless from the perspective of how you actually start building applications because it's a lot more loosely coupled, um, a lot more uh, focused on just different types of events as well. Um, so you're not necessarily making everything that you got, well, you certainly can. Um, but the uh, point is that we will actually look at the event stream. We will take care of uh, scaling up on based on the amount of requests that are coming in. So, uh, we'll get a little bit more into that as we go. But the important thing is you're only going to be paying for the amount of time your code spends running. That's important um, because that means that you get to do things like some of my customers and boast 100 fold cost reductions. That said, I'd argue that that's actually not the biggest savings that you get with serverless. So before I get too far into like the why this thing surveyed, functions as a service is the one we're going to be focusing on. And again, you're going to have some set of events. That could be an HTTP request, be a timer. That can be an image getting uploaded into a blob, a message coming in on a queue, things like that. You're going to give us a piece of code. You're going to tell us, hey, this is the actual piece of, uh, of the processing that I want to do. I'm not going to focus on the data source. I'm not going to focus on getting stuff from the event source. I'm just going to write the code that actually operates on it. And that can be in a variety of languages. And then sort of unique to the functions platform is this notion of um, outputs that are just strong integrations. You can use an SDK and call it anything you want. So it's all code. Um, we talk about like hello worlds of serverless. Um, it tends to just be uploading an image to a blob store. Um, that's actually a surprisingly common scenario because a lot of people have a lot of image processing needs. So it's pretty easy to bolt that onto an existing application. But um, not much code, right? Simple hello world. Uh, and the config is just me saying that I'm going to use a blob uh, trigger and I want to make sure that it's pulling you know, from this data source. And it's going to show up in my code as my blob. And there we go. So nothing too much. This is all I need to deploy, by the way. This is all I'm sitting with the cloud provider. And everything just goes after that. So the reason why serverless is so powerful is because actually it allows you to own less. And owning less means you get to do more interesting things with the things that you do own, such as your application logic. Focus in on actually making something that delivers value in your business. Focus on getting things out faster. And then, frankly, just being able to 
have fewer operational worries. You really shouldn't take my word for it, so I always like to include some case studies. Um, Relativity is a really fun one because they took uh, four months of development effort to about a week. That's pretty powerful. That's, that's a lot of cost savings. I also really like the Fujifilm case study, um, in part because theirs is actually a little bit more involved. It was an on-premises migration. They were basically <coughs> writing an entire application. And what's fun about this is you know, they, they took them about six months for a full validated release. But we have excellent architectures to work with from it. And I think this is a good representation of a serverless app. <laughs> serverless apps are going to involve maybe a couple different components, right? You might have multiple functions running around uh, that represent you know, different actual pieces of compute. But I'm also integrating with lots of services, right? So I'm pulling you know, APIs that do actual cognitive you know, recognition and things like that. Um, the scenario here, by the way, is that um, their main implementation of this ImageWorks application is used by the uh, Nipponese, uh, Nippon Professional Baseball, so uh, baseball in Japan. Uh, they are, uh, they're major league, um, they just get tons of photos from game day. And so it's a processing pipeline for that. I think it took um, a 40 minute operation down to four uh, was, the, was one of the main goals of the re-architecture. But we're bringing in different services and we're making sure that where possible we use services that offload work for us. Managed services means we don't have to own things. And then we're using serverless compute in order to actually drive the parts of logic that we do have to have some controls, some say over. Quick question. Yeah. Are you going to be able to share these slides? Sure, after? I can. Thank you. Do it. So, from a scenario perspective, it's a building block. You can really do anything you want with it. What we see from our customers is lots of folks building app backends, app, you know, standard uh, things like that. IoT is actually really popular because you have lots of devices creating lots of events. And so, it's a natural fit there. But uh, the other one that's really interesting is automation. Because automation is something that almost everybody encounters because you're going to provision stuff in the cloud. And how you deal with that stuff can get really interesting. So uh, there's a, probably a whole set of things we talk about, like security ops and things like that. That's not really my area of expertise, so we're going to focus a little bit more on app stack. But I do want to call it out, because this is a very popular use of things like functions. Um, if you're going to go provision a bunch of infrastructure, it's kind of nice to not have to create infrastructure, so you can go create more infrastructure. <laughs> so. Serverless sounds pretty great, and we're all loving it, and that means that, you know, hey, we're, we're safe, right? No. <laughs> so, yeah, I, mean, um, I would argue that this, I mean, look at it this way. By using serverless, you're already making a good security posture for your application. I mentioned things like the Meltdown Spectre rollout, so the, the, those are first disclosed. Um, a lot of things are handled by platform provider. So, already good, not perfect. It doesn't matter about the servers necessarily because your app security is what we really need to concern with. And this is probably the crux of the problem, in my opinion. So uh, if I editorialize for a bit, I think the problem is that folks are taking serverless and they're saying, this is a cure-all. This is the best thing ever. I'm going to build all sorts of things with it. I'm going to build them really fast. And I'm not going to necessarily do all the things that I should have been doing this whole time. We'll talk more a bit about that. But, when we do start talking security, I think one of the things that you'll commonly run into in the cloud is this notion of the shared responsibility model. And the idea is that there's some things that are burdened of the cloud provider and some things that are burdened of the user, right? So when we were on-premises, we owned everything. When we moved to infrastructure as a service, hey, the cloud provider comes in and helps you know, get rid of some, some of the concerns. When we're fully you know, software as a service or even some of like the dev uh, platform uh, offerings, um, you know, every, almost everything's managed, mostly worrying about data. And the platform as a service makes progress, um, but it's not perfect. So the question is, what do we do about serverless? Huh, that's not very much, is it? We've just changed the application server, which, hey, that's one less thing to worry about, but I still have all my logic, all the endpoints, all the data, I still have some network stuff. So there's concerns. Now, this is heresy in serverless circles, because I think everybody at some point has said, hey, we should just call it something else. I'm not actually seriously proposing that we get rid of the serverless term, although it is annoying. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, at least, I want to actually reframe it, because serverless talks about less. And all the things I just talked about were what you don't have to do, and all the other things that you get back. But that's the important thing to focus on. 
we're getting a little bit more focused on cloud native, and we're getting more focused on using other services. And that creates its own problems, right? Because we're bringing a bunch of things into our system. And we have a bunch of connections between them. And we still have to secure those. And like I said, I think this is a risk compensation problem. There's folks out there who are using serverless, and frankly, they're getting lax with some of the web security things that they should have done all along. So if you're familiar with a lot of like web application security, it's going to be kind of familiar. Now, we start looking at the OWASP, the uh, Open Web Application Security Project, I want to say. Um, they have a history of publishing a set of top vulnerabilities that you see in web applications. And it's got a history going back to 2010. Um, if you jump through the years, honestly, not a whole lot changes. Things bounce around in relative priority, but the list largely remains the same. They're working on a serverless one. That's exciting. Actually, it's gone through first draft, and uh, they're actually doing a lot of uh, call for review and additional feedback. So uh, please get involved. This is actually an excellent way to help uh, make a difference and shape the conversation around security and circles in general. But let's see what they say here. Well, yeah, you're executing code, and if you write your code insecurely, uh, you're still going to get attacked. Sure, seems obvious. Um, and you know, the attack and defense techniques are different than what we're used to. Oh. That's interesting, because what that says is basically all the tools that we have, all the ways that we go about this, well, a lot of them did rely on the application server. And so now suddenly we have a different challenge in terms of how we monitor things, and it's just generally decoupled, right? We're more likely to have a uh, decoupled microservice architecture, and if you haven't figured out microservice architecture security and dealing with distributed components, distributed systems, well, that's going to be new. So especially for folks that are coming from a model and jumping straight into serverless, there's a whole learning curve associated with it. But I've been very abstract, and I want to make this fun. So let's play a game. Please spot the vulnerability. Um, so <laughs> little, this is a little small. I'm sorry for that. Um, another kind of hello world of serverless. I have a JavaScript function here that is going to receive a pull request notification from GitHub. And it's going to leave a comment thanking the contributor. Right? We're going to be a good open source citizen. We're going to be uh, you know, nice and uh, friendly. And uh, does anybody see it yet? There's you probably not one. Are messages coming from GitHub? Is that well, that's actually a good one. Oh. I'm more concerned about the fact that I seem to have left a secret in my source code. But of course, we don't know if we ever do this, right? And this isn't even serverless, right? This is just normal app development. We know how to do these things. We no, consider URL. Sorry? Magic there you go. Um, but one thing that we're seeing quite a bit of is of course secrets management as well, right? Because we want to centralize these things, let's have a rotation policy to be able to deal with them. GitHub maybe is a contrived example for something like this. But we can you know, receive the event from GitHub. We can go and say, hey, I'm going to get some identity token, right? I just need some job that allows me to go talk into a secret store. Uh, and then, of course, we actually go call into that secret store, fetch our GitHub secret. And then we get to handle things. That was straightforward, and it's actually not that much code. And believe it or not, there's actually a shorter version of this too. But the problem here is that nothing here is serverless. Nothing is unique. This is code I could throw into a, just an Express application. The problem is how that token gets resolved. How do I actually deal with identity? This is arguably the number one problem in serverless because people overshare identity because they have lots of different functions lying around. And they give all those functions the same permissions. So in Azure, we have this concept called a function app, which is just a grouping of functions that share code or config. So I might have multiple functions that are doing different things. And those different things might need different permissions. So this is a bad thing, because all of a sudden, I've given a function that supposedly only does reading permission to write to some data store. So what I should do is split things up, have things in different function apps, make sure that I'm doing the principle of least privilege thing. right? So a function only ever has configuration or permissions roles according to what it needs. And the benefit of this with you know, a function app is also a deployment unit, so we can actually go microservices and have you know, isolated deployments and things like that as well. So general goodness, generally a good pattern, split things up, make sure you're doing role assignments properly. But that, like, this is truly the number one issue that we see across 
like serverless in general. It's just folks just bloating permissions where they don't need to. Okay, let's do it a little differently now. Please spot the vulnerability in this architecture diagram. I'm not going to let you go too long because I'm cheating. It's everything. <laughs> and every connection in between. I'm going to start answering my first snarky response now. Right? <laughs> but um, I think with the exception of the analytics dashboard, which I would love to come up with an attack for, um, pretty much everything here, right, we're dealing with a distributed architecture. And if I compromise any component, I can start injecting all sorts of things. There's this class of attacks in serverless called event injection, which effectively, if somehow I can get access to this blob store and just start shoving stuff into it, like let's say I leave a you know unprotected public blob, right? Well, all of a sudden that's going to cause this function to run. And I can do some clever things to figure out what I can do and start exfiltrating other data or who knows what. So we have to actually look at each part of the diagram. And like it's really important to actually figure out the connections between. So we talked about permissions. Like if this has too much, well, we need to actually uh, downplay that. And to make it a little bit more concrete, I mean, Let's, let's, let's do it with code again. Code is more fun. And this is a, uh, this is just a queue. Uh, so I'm getting you an HTTP request. And I'm dropping the body basically into a queue. And actually, to Bobby's point earlier, I'm not validating that input. I'm just throwing it in the queue. And this is fine. Look at how secure this function is, because it's not operating on it. It's fine, right? Except I'm putting it downstream. So what happens downstream? Well. That place where I'm serializing the body, turns out this code is running. What's wrong here? Uh, well, yes, but <laughs> yes, the fact that it's SQL is arguably a problem, but specifically the fact that I'm doing just a very classic SQL injection attack. Yeah. So now, all of a sudden, it's not enough for me to secure one application component or one microservice. I have to be worried about being a good citizen inside of an entire application architecture. Again, not unique to serverless. This is a microservices problem. But it's something that we see quite a bit of. So let's talk about inputs and outputs. So of course, we're going to you know, make sure that we validate our own inputs. right? The person who wrote that second function should be ashamed. right? They have a SQL injection attack. They weren't, uh, they weren't uh, sanitizing things properly, all that stuff. Like That's, that's a thing we need to, to, to fix, no, no question. But maybe there's an argument for actually doing a little bit more about output validation and making sure that we're being good citizens, again, of our architecture. I think you'll often see folks talk about identity from the, how do I actually create inbound? You know, how do, I, how do I deal with authenticating user, knowing who they are, creating a profile, acting, you know, uh, creating uh, records for them, things like that. That's great. We definitely want to do our standard authorization checks and things like that. But we have the flip side, where we're actually communicating out. And we have this role assignment problem, right? So are we actually enforcing least privilege? Are we actually making sure that things are you know, as clean as they can be? Um, there's also a scale. So serverless scales really well. We see events coming in. We just throw instances behind the scenes at it. And you know, you're only paying for the amount of time your code spends running, so that's not actually a problem. It's just a matter of how many I get. Well, maybe there's a denial of service concern there. And really, a lot of folks are arguing that uh, in serverless, it's becoming a denial of wallet, um, because we're just going to charge you for it. But there's also the flip side, which is the strangest piece of feedback I've gotten, which is you scale too well, and now all of my application is DDoSing another component of my app. So you get the lovely self Self, self denial of service. Um, this that I'm about to show you is a real example of an application that was in the safety critical space. And resolving this was a great joy because, oh goodness. Um, so let's say for some reason we are deciding, hey, we're going to send a notification. We're going to use some machine learning or some other data processing or just human input. We're going to have this API that then pushes something to push a, a, a push notification down to a device. So um, the specific blocks aren't important, but we've got a device that's going to receive a message. And that device is then going to call back home, and it's going to interface with a, uh, with, a, with a function API. Well, what if I have lots of devices, and I want to send notifications to all of them? This is fine. Serverless scales super well, and we'll keep up with all of those devices. 
for the folks who really don't like SQL. Um, let's say I just have a, a, a something that's not as scalable, just anything downstream. Um, there's certainly ways to address that, but all of a sudden everything goes to a bottleneck, right? And now I have a concern. So there's lots of different ways to address this. Um, one is, yes, work on your configuration so your downstream services are more scalable. But two, um, in this specific example, it's actually OK to batch notifications. And so knowing how your event sources work throughout your application and being able to control those can also be really important. But you need to have general protections in place you know, at, at each layer. Again, it's all about making sure that you have, um, you're not focusing on security of individual components uh, and doing that at the, uh, you know, at the expense of you know, looking at the complete app. And then we get to networking, everybody's favorite topic. So the problem is that networking is not super great in serverless. It's still a lot of space. Did I mention that serverless is really young and evolving? Um, if we compare it to, say, you know, our dedicated platform as a service offerings, okay, there's some similar things and a bunch of others. And all of these are not really available in serverless, or at least they have they come at major costs. If you want to put a serverless, uh, you know, app inside of a virtual network, chances are you're going to see some cold start, some some slowdown, performance hits, things like that. So we've got a lot to do, and certainly this is very much on the part of the platform providers to come up with solutions here. Um, and there are some things happening. Um, we are actually looking at a, a hybrid model that brings things together, and that's not yet available. Um, but if it's something you're super interested in, please chat with me. But the point is that the space is super new. And so there are places, of parts of security that, you know, we can rely on some of the traditional network security pieces as long as we can integrate with them. And not, it's not always a clean, clean solution. The other piece uh, that is worth calling out is that your traditional security tooling is not going to be exactly the same. Um, at the very least, you're missing the logical application server, right? So that nice event loop that comes with most you know, web uh, platforms, Express, things like that. And that's where a lot of things like middleware would get injected, all of the fun things that you would use to actually start securing your application. You can bring things in still. But you're often bringing them in at a per function basis, which gets very tedious and difficult to manage and very easy for a developer to overlook. This is not great. This is why there are plenty of other, um, there's tons and tons of serverless security startups springing up to address this problem. Um, a few worth looking at if you're interested. Uh, PeerSec, SNCC, uh, TwistLock is doing some stuff. Um, you know, all of your, uh, some of your favorites uh, from the container security world as well. But uh, in general, like this is still new. They're still figuring it out. We're all still figuring it out. So I say this not to scare you off of serverless, but it is worth knowing going in. And it's something that we definitely want help with. Um, you'll also, if you talk to anybody about serverless long enough, are going to hear them start complaining about observability. This is just a general problem uh, for distributed applications. Again, thriving startup ecosystem around this. Um, so we've got folks like uh, Epsigon, um, uh, Iopipe, you know, tons, tons and tons of them. But there's a problem where you need to actually see, hey, what happened? How did a given execution go through? What did the event source actually look like? Uh, how did I transform it? How did it go all the way through? And this is especially hard when you're dealing with the diversity of event sources, right? I mean, most of the examples I've been showing you are blobs and queues and things like that. But what happens when I start doing, you know, a fire hose of data coming off of an IoT device fleet? What happens when I start mixing that in with all those others? Um, it gets it gets messy. And so there are again solutions. Um, some of them are coming from the platform providers. Some of them from the community. But how you get a centralized, you know, one pane of glass over the entire application? Again, not just looking at individual functions. So that's still something that's evolving. Um, I will just shamelessly plug one of my favorite features in Azure. Um, I say this with absolutely zero like uh, insincerity, like being able to use our application app feature. Like I'm drilling in and I can see an entire request uh, trace across various queues and across various functions. I get a nice visual map of it. Um, we have an animated uh, here that's looping, but 
um, I can actually get down to the point where it shows in this function, this line of code through this exception, which is pretty exciting. Um, so personally, I have very many people to thank for making this happen just for my applications. What's um, it called it's application map. It's uh, a part of the App Insights product. Uh, insights. Yep. Cool. So we took a turn here. I started nice and rosy about the promises of serverless, and then I got into some of the concerns of security, and most of those were fine. And then we got into this space of networking and monitoring and security tooling, and things don't look as rosy. But the good news is this is all evolving really fast, and there's actually a really active community around serverless. Really active. Like, I'm very impressed and very glad to be a part of it. Um, there are a ton of great conferences that you can go to, single day, single track things like serverless days. Um, serverless conf is also probably the biggest one. Um, and of course, there's plenty of meetups in the area as well. Um, I'll, I'll plug one here in a bit. But this is a space where, you know, we're seeing a lot of progress, and like I mentioned, there's this OWASP project. That's actually a place where we're having basically the community come together and try and identify the problems with security and serverless so that you can actually go and start tackling it. But it definitely comes down to the fact that, honestly, we as vendors have a lot of work to do still, right? And you should hold us accountable. Um, our team is super accessible. Um, our product is actually pretty much entirely open source with like a few minor, minor exceptions, but um, you can always flog an issue against us or things like that. We're definitely glad to have it. Um, we need more people talking about security and serverless in general, if this is a space that's of any interest to you at all. Uh, this is a fantastic place to maybe uh, start giving talks yourself or you know, looking into uh, writing about uh, your, favorite, um, your favorite applications and things like that. Um, but we definitely need people talking about this because it's something that needs to evolve quickly. And of course, that also means just sharing what you know. If you start building things with serverless at all, or even just if you have general security experience from standard web app development, this is stuff that we need to make sure that people are seeing. We have folks who are getting their start in the cloud and just cloud development using serverless. And that's really exciting, but that also means we have a responsibility to make sure that they're stumbling into success. And of course, part of being a community is also being a welcoming community. And so uh, that's certainly something that I've seen in the serverless community, but it's something we need to also maintain. So I promised I would plug. There's actually a meetup on Thursday, <laughs> a meetup with a fantastic, fantastic Photoshop job. But um, we'll be doing a bunch of different things around uh, just serverless in general, um, I can't remember the exact nature of the talks that are going to be there on Thursday, but I'll certainly be there uh, to see it. So if anybody's interested, please come along. It's a really fun community to be a part of. So I also should highlight some folks who have been fighting the good fight for longer than I have. Um, we talk about uh, serverless conf. Actually, this is a really good talk that Mark gave um, just on how to actually get things going, and you know, uh, he, he has some strong opinions, as the title might imply. Um, Yen gave a meetup talk that's actually a fantastic deep dive and showing some real attacks done against real uh, running functions, uh, which is a little bit more practical for sure than what we saw today. And then the serverless top 10 project. You can be a part of it. I cannot emphasize this enough. We need lots of community feedback on this right now. So. Uh, if anyone's interested in that, I can definitely connect you with the right folks and we can get some, some channels going there as well. So what did we learn? Well, we learned the service is pretty cool and it is a good starting point, but you know, there's there's this chance that you might get a little too comfortable, right? Because you know, the the the, the downfall of serverless, I think, is that folks really just start building things and they start shipping them. And that is great. Developers love this. IT, sometimes less so. How do you set things up so that people actually do make the right default assumptions? We're doing lots of work to try and create that on the platform side, but of course, you know, there's always going to be different uh, things that different organizations need to deal with. But, you know, all the standard security things that you're familiar with, th those need to be at play as well. And just think about the fact that you're taking on more services, you're dealing with other components. They might be managed for you, and that's wonderful. But that doesn't absolve you of responsibility over what they're doing to your app. And we're creating more connections, right? 
distributed architectures. We're creating more secrets. We need things like secrets management, but we need to make sure that the permissions that we're applying to all of our serverless components are, you know, well, appropriate. And, you know, it's not just inputs. Outputs need to be validated too. Uh, I think this is really critical for the success of an overall application. Um, we still have work to do, right? So networking, observability, those are gonna be top of mind. Um, what security tooling is available? And then of course, you know, hey, this is again an evolving space. I'd love to chat more about this with anybody who's interested. So with that said, I wanted to leave some time for questions. We can also move on uh, to the next talk if things weren't that, but thanks very much, appreciate it. Yep, sure will. Yeah. So, not speaking, just there for fun. Yeah. So. Now, what does the Microsoft do to mitigate roadmaps to improve those serverless security? Yeah, sure. Um, so, there's, a, a, at the risk of getting a little too platform specific, um, on the Azure platform, we have this thing called Azure Security Center, um, which is a really nice way of setting up all sorts of policies across your entire stack. Um, and including uh, and getting sorts of telemetry recommendations and things like that. So um, that's something that you'll see evolving quite a bit where um, if we will be proactively notifying you about misconfigurations and things like that, um, permissions groupings where we can, things like that. So that's us trying to use everything that we can see about your application to try and let you know, hey, this looks suspicious. So that's one big part of it. Um, the observability piece that I mentioned, um, that application map is relatively new. Um, but it's also got a few limitations. So I showed you a really nice picture. Um, things, you know, need a little work in a few places. So that's certainly something that's evolving because we want you to have really good insight into your application overall. So those are definitely part of it. Um, there's also quite a bit, I mentioned secrets management and connections. Uh, there's quite a bit evolving around that. Um, if folks are paying attention to what we do, uh, there's the, the Key Vault service that I mentioned. Um, the best way to work with it, in my opinion, is managed identities. That's where Basically, we say that you're gonna have a service principle of some kind. You're gonna have to do like a client credentials flow in OAuth terms to get a token and go call into some resource. Um, we actually take care of managing those secrets and rotating them and everything for you so that from your perspective, all you're saying is, I would like a token, please, and we just give it to you. Um, so those kinds of things allow a little bit more flexibility, right? There's no operational burden of some of those security concerns. Um, at least on the secrets rotation side, uh, but you're still getting a fantastic developer experience. So we're not compromising anything. And again, this is all about making sure that a developer is going to, by default, start doing things that are the right way, right? We don't want anybody to kind of go rogue. I mean, what's the number one rule of security? Don't roll your own, at least in crypto. So um, we wanna make sure that we're pushing folks to use the best practices that are already established. Sure. Do you know if anybody is looking, so you outlined what serverless um, kind of exposed the identity and access control problem. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody looking at more of an object capability approach to this infrastructure? And I don't know if they're familiar with that approach enough, but it might be kind of an esoteric question. But it sounds like a very specific term that I'm f afraid to guess at. Okay. So um, I would love to hear more about it, though. or just like not even the security stuff, what serverless is, anything like that? We feel good, we're all serverless experts, we're gonna go start writing apps tomorrow. <laughs> Man, I did a good job, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we uh, take 10, um, and we'll get our next speaker all set up.
Will you know when it's working? Oh, yeah. Do you get like a sound? Okay. You're, you're loud and clear. How many people do you have watching you right now? Somewhere between four and 20. It's nothing. <laughs> That's not on my slide. <laughs> <laughs> Should I get started, do you think? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Naomi Borneman. Uh, <laughs> that's my brother. Uh, I work at Milliman, which is an actuarial firm, uh, which all you really need to know from that is it's got a lot of smart mathy people. Uh, we're distributed across the country or across the world, actually. Um, but, uh, but it's okay if you've never heard of us. Um, I honestly prefer it that way. Uh, I chose uh, cross-site scripting for this talk uh, because I've been doing security about seven years now. I have the OSCP and the OSCE, and I found through all of this, nobody's really talked about cross-site scripting. It's just one of those things. Like for the OSCP, uh, a lot of the focus is on server-side exploitation. And uh, cross-site scripting is client-side. We'll get into the details later. Um, but it, it would have been hard, I think, to construct labs that have you exploit clients and then you use that for server-side exploitation. So basically, they glossed over it. They gave you just the basic, inject these script tags, oh, it works, okay, you're done. I wanted to dive into depth a little bit more. Uh, and uh, before I guess I do that, I wanted to get a feel for you all quickly. So I guess, first of all, how many of you have just dabbled with cross-site scripting? Okay, good. How many of you are developers? Eh, okay, that's a relief because I think uh, in some of the advertising you did, you talked about how I would talk about uh, preventing cross-site scripting. I'm really not gonna cover that too much. I'm just gonna talk about how failed attempts at blocking cross-site scripting can be bypassed. That may have been the Auth0 uh, social media guy getting a little over your Okay. <laughs> so, sorry. No worries. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, just places I've worked at before uh, and my Twitter handle here. Uh, so first of all, we're going to cover briefly what is cross-site scripting, all the different types of it. Uh, we'll get into some more advanced techniques and bypassing WAFs and other filters. Um, those two bullet points kind of blend in together because an advanced technique might involve bypassing and vice versa. So um, it'll all just become a lot of information to throw at you. What I'm hoping from these two slides is to really get your curiosity going um, and have you think more out of the box when you're working on a cross-site scripting exploit. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the fun stuff that you can do once you've found cross-site scripting. Uh, and just a plug for Rodolfo. Um, he has a website called uh, Brute Logic. A lot of the data for this talk comes from his website. He's just, I think, probably one of the world leaders in cross-site scripting right now, it would be impossible not to mention him. Okay, cross-site scripting. Uh, cross-site scripting is a, a code injection attack where an attacker has found a way to induce the user uh, to either click on a link or visit a page that has been embedded with malicious JavaScript. Uh, the JavaScript runs on their browser uh, and the whole attack is sort of contained within their browser. So this isn't a way to attack the website directly, though it could potentially be used that way later. Um, it occurs when user input is not processed properly and it's reflected back to the user. There's three types. You may have heard of these already, reflected, stored, and DOM-based. I think there's a petition out to rename DOM-based as client-side. We'll talk more about it in a second. Reflected cross-site scripting uh, usually happens in a get request parameter. So nothing is stored on the website. User input is taken directly from a variable that the user sends. And it's maybe filtered, maybe not, but it's sent right back out on the page, presented to the user through their browser. It, this type of cross-site scripting requires phishing or social engineering because you need the user to click on a link in order to initiate the process. There are tools that you can use to help with your phishing. If you're an evil person, I'm sure you can think of a lot of ways to do this. URL shortening, uh, like bit.ly links, are a great way to hide your payload in a get request parameter. 
tidy it up into a short link and send it off to your users. Um, and then here's just a sample of what that vulnerable code might look like. Uh, you can see here we're getting the get request parameter name straight out of the URL, sending it right back through the page, not filtered or anything. Um, and if we throw in some malicious JavaScript there, it'll be processed with no problem. Stored is exactly how it sounds. The page needs to have some sort of data store. It could be a flat file. It could be a database. It could be anything in between. Uh, but for some reason, uh, an attacker can find a way to implant malicious JavaScript into that data store so that when a user visits the site, it's rendered, uh, and it shows up, and it infects their browser. Um, this is persistent across multiple sessions. You don't need phishing to trigger it. You just need the user to browse to the page, however they're going to do that. You can also use this method to infect maybe administrators of the site potentially and, and escalate things further from there. Um, this also is a lot easier to detect because you can imagine you just have to parse through your data store and look for relics. And then we have DOM-based. So the DOM is a document object model. It's basically your browser parses through all the HTML that a page serves up, and it turns it into an object, basically it turns a flat file into an object. Uh, and it's just a way of parsing through all the pieces of that HTML. DOM-based cross-site scripting attacks are pretty interesting in that that data that you've used potentially to infect the user might not even be sent to the, brow to the server. So uh, actually, let me get into an example of this one. I have a demo here. I created a little page uh, for pretty much each of these. And with any luck, it'll work on the first try. Oh, my IP address changed. All right. So in this example, I have a variable called test. It's a get request parameter. Let me just make sure that's right. That's called data. All right. Uh, super simple. No website would ever be this basic. The word test there is being pulled straight from the get request. In this example, the server logs would show the user entered in a variable of test, the value of test, and this is the page that rendered. However, there are some places where you can place data that might not be sent to the server. For instance, anything that's sent after an anchor tag or the hashtag, that data is completely restricted to being in this browser never sent to the server. So if I find DOM-based cross-site scripting and can take advantage of that anchor, my payload still goes through. And in fact, here I've got my alert box. Oh, gosh. What are the odds this wouldn't work? Well, I can at least prove to you it didn't. It, and we'll cover HTML entities soon. You know, this was just working in Firefox. Well, we'll see if it continues to fail here. But uh, at the very least, I can prove to you 
that data is not being sent. Let's refresh the page. Oh, there it goes. Oh, that's right. When you refresh the page, then the browser knows to pull the new data that you entered in. All right, there we go. Uh, so I got my script working. And sure enough, when I look at the logs, I know this is pretty small. I just counted the access logs. All I see is the page I visited, no other data beyond that. That's what makes DOM-based DOM cross-site scripting a little more scary, in my opinion, is there's really not a lot of ways to detect Uh, on the server side, a lot of people when they're putting in protections, and again, we'll talk about this, they remember to in put in server side filtering. We also need an addition to that client side filtering to detect these. Uh, and then previously, I mentioned that reflective cross-site scripting usually happens over GET request. There is a way to compensate if you notice cross-site scripting over a POST request. It takes a couple more steps. Essentially, you need to stand up your own fake server, entice the user to click on that fake server, and then have that fake server conduct the post for you on the user's behalf with the malicious JavaScript in it. Send that up, redirect the user there. So it's a way to uh, sort of simulate a GET request from the user's perspective when you're handling the post in the background. Uh, and then there's actually one more type of cross-site scripting I didn't talk about here. I think it's gaining in popularity a little bit. It's called self-cross-site scripting. I found one of these once before I knew what it was called. Um, but it's a way, uh, the only way to trigger this cross-site scripting is if you enter the parameters into the field yourself. So it's not being sent over any type of request. It's not being sent to the server. The processing is all handling on the browser. And it only happens when you enter in a field and enter in the JavaScript yourself. Um, there are some kind of clever ways to get users to enter in malicious JavaScript. There's some cool blogs about it. If you're curious, I recommend checking it out. Um, in general, uh, in cross-site scripting, your user input's going to pop you in a lot of different places, in a lot of different contexts on the page. You might be in between tags. You might be in the middle of a tag, or you might even be inline JavaScript already. Uh, it makes talking about cross-site scripting a little tricky, because whenever we talk about this, we need to talk about the context we're in, and then talk about how we're going to break out of uh, whatever tag we're in, or whatever block we're in, and then execute our JavaScript. It also makes defending against cross-site scripting incredibly challenging, because you need to compensate whatever filters you're putting in place need to depend on the context that the output is appearing in. So, you know, if you're inline JavaScript, you don't need to worry about angle brackets because the user's not going to enter those in. They're already in the script. Uh, as opposed to in between tags, you're going to filter on different things. So, uh, and I wish you could pull up your OWASP top 10. You'll see that cross-site scripting has been in the top 10 uh, for, oh my gosh, the last 10 years almost. Uh, and the reason for that is this is just incredibly hard to defend against. All right, so let's talk about more fun cross-site scripting. Uh, before we get there, I just want to talk to you about HTML tags really quick. Uh, most of the time we learn about um, HTML tags and HTML5 is even more versatile, I found. Um, they just normally look like you've got angle bracket tag, space, value equals, whatever the value is, another angle bracket. But it turns out you can actually put in uh, a lot of junk here, uh, spaces, other variable declar declarations, uh, just characters if you want. Some characters are allowed. Uh, and all of this can be used to your advantage when you're planning your cross-site scripting attack. Um, I threw in a bunch of space characters here that you could use, new lines, uh, plus signs, slashes. Um, some of these may work, some of them may not work. It's browser dependent, browser version dependent, um, and then filter dependent. Um, and then just down here is a classic example of 
just sort of how weird you can get. No spaces, if you need to avoid spaces. Um, so we've got a lot of versatility here. Um, so we have uh, two different types of tags I'm going to talk about here, or two different uh, ways that we're going to be able to induce cross-site scripting using tags. Um, event handlers are one. Uh, I see these used uh, probably 90% of the time. If I get cross-site scripting, it's through one of these. Um, so a lot of these event handlers require UI. If you find yourself with your user input being planted in the middle of a tag, uh, say an image tag, you can say, all right, um, if someone clicks on that image, perform my JavaScript. And it's as easy as this, on click, and then you give it your little JavaScript statement. Uh, on uh, drag, on blur, on mouse over, um, any UI induced event, it does take a little bit of luck because you're counting on the user to perform an action for you. And that's where some social engineering might come in handy. Um, the non-UI uh, uh, event handlers are better, in my opinion, if you can find them. Um, on error is the most frequent one, I think, where uh, if you're implanting an image, you can give it the name of a bad image, an image that doesn't exist, and then tell it if you find an error trying to load that image, perform this action. So that's a case where you would say, uh, I know that this is going to execute 100% of the time because that image doesn't exist. And there's a lot. Uh, I listed what probably a two dozen event handlers here. I think there's upwards of 70 total. Um, I picked some of the more common ones, but uh, I recommend doing research for sure. Uh, and I have another example. I downloaded DVWA. Oh, not logged in. Uh, which, if you aren't familiar, uh, is damn vulnerable web application. It's a vulnerable by design web application. I don't remember who. Does anyone remember who made DVWA? Anyone who's okay? I don't think it's OWASP. I think they have WebGoat. Um, but it's a, if, if this is the first time you're seeing DVWA, definitely install it. You can see there's a lot of attack techniques that you can practice here. You can also set the difficulty settings uh, here. Low, medium, high, or impossible. Impossible is an example where it shouldn't be hackable if they've done it right and they're trying to teach you how to secure your applications. So in this case, uh, we have just a text box. What is your name? It's Naomi. And if I look, is this, can I, should I make this bigger so you all can see? Would that be helpful? Maybe a point. It's hard to see back there. OK. I can at least make part of it bigger. OK, that was uh, false. I'll, I'll read it out loud so you all can see. Um, let's take a look at what's going on here. So um, in this case, my input has loaded me in between two pre-tags. Um, and DVWA is pretty handy in that they also will give you the source. So in this case, there's a little bit of filtering happening. Uh, actually, in this case, there's no filtering happening. Uh, I can look at all the levels here, though. Uh, in high reflected cross-site scripting, they're replacing with a regex replace. Uh, the word script 
with any amount of characters in between if you tried to fill it with uh, those new line characters or those spacers. Uh, just replace the word script uh, with nothing, with blank. Uh, and then place what's left in your output. Well, that's fine. I don't need the word script uh, because what I learned in the presentation was that the word script doesn't appear anywhere in, in these types of situations. I'm just going to insert in a full tag. It allows me to have ankle, ankle brackets uh, and load up my alert box. So let's go do that. My name is Naomi. Image source equals, this is a bad JPEG. And then on error, give me an alert. And that's it. So uh, an example of bad filtering, we bypassed it using our brains. All right. We also have resources. This unfortunately would have gotten caught by that filter uh, that removes the word script out of anything. So resources are a way to put inline JavaScript in instead of uh, say um, whatever, it, I guess resources can appear in several attributes. So instead of an image, for instance, you might put JavaScript. Instead of a hyperlink, you'll just put straight JavaScript through. It's like feeding in a feed as opposed to a static object. Um, here are some attributes that support resources. The way you would determine if you're in a tag that has that attribute, uh, you'll, you would just Google it or whatever. So, uh, you know, I know inputs have form actions and form actions can have resources. That would be how you would check that. Um, if you find, like in the situation we were just in, that the word JavaScript is being filtered. I think that's pretty common. You can try to base64 encode the JavaScript, and then the browser will know how to handle that just fine. It, does, it does that all the time. Um, and, and you can bypass a lot of filters. So resources, I don't use them as much. It's good to know they're there. Um, it avoids using angled brackets for the most part, uh, which I find to be pretty handy. Um, but I prefer events personally. And I have an example for that too. I'm just going to skip over that. We can, if we have time afterwards, we will uh, we'll go through that. File uploads can contain cross-site scripting. Uh, the metadata, the EXIF data on the file can contain cross-site scripting. If that's being rendered back to the page, the most common one is the title of the image. When you, you know, go through the menu and you click your image, It'll display the title of the file that you've just chosen before it uploads it to the server. That might be an opportunity for cross-site scripting. SVG files have a full metadata header, that is uh, XML, that can contain cross-site scripting. Um, if you have control of the content type, you could replace a PNG with your own text file, which is JavaScript, essentially. Or you can try to change the content type to a content type that allows for embedded XML, like an SVG. So if you have control over the content type, you have a lot of options there. Um, and if you are, again, dealing with streams and resources, if the image is not actually being saved to the file, if it's being sent as a stream, and you have control over that, then you can just throw in your own resource uh, string here, which is just an alert box. Lots of options for file upload. All right. How do we get around filters? First question is, well, how do you even filter cross-site scripting? As I said earlier, it's really difficult. Um, you need to think both upstream and downstream how you're handling the data. So first of all, to prevent DOM-based cross-site scripting, you have to do client-side filtering. But you can't just do client-side filtering because any attacker will be able to use a proxy and get around that. Uh, so you also need to think about your user input on the server side. When you're receiving it, are you processing it in a way that will not be infected? It needs to be filtered before you process. And then it also needs to be filtered 
after you process it when you display it to the page. So there's a lot of places where this could all go wrong. Um, in general, you have a lot of decisions to make here. I think there's a lot of libraries out there that teach you how to do it right. But the truth is, cross-site scripting is one of the most prevalent vulnerabilities out there today. So if any of you come up with some way to prevent cross-site scripting, you'll probably be a billionaire, I think. What are some ways to not do it correctly? Well, we'll talk about this. Uh, any type of character block listing, like disallowing angle brackets is maybe your most successful option. Um, but disallowing quotes, uh, disallowing the word script, we can get by almost every single one of these. Uh, escaping characters, we'll talk about that soon. And then reflections are, oh my gosh, going to be really fun. So. Uh, say we have this payload, we want to get it through, we know that there are characters being block listed. What are some characters we might have to worry about? Well, the angle brackets, for sure. Maybe the quotes, and maybe spaces. If they're smart, maybe they think this user input shouldn't have any spaces, quotes. I've done a little bit of filtering based on how I think the user should use it, but, uh, but I'm not exactly sure that I've done a good job. Here are some ways that you can change your input to get around these filters. Uh, the first one is encoding. This is URL encoding. You could also try HTML encoding. You could try double encoding, see if that works. If you have control over the resource, you can base64 encode. Um, different browsers are going to decode, de-encode your input differently. Uh, so I would recommend playing around and trying a few of these. Uh, the second example, there are no spaces in this payload, as we talked about earlier. And then you'll also notice uh, that these are grave accents. I think that's what they're called, the little tick marks. Um, a lot of browsers will parse those as if they're quotes. But a lot of people will forget to block those when they're blocking quotation marks. The third example, uh, if you're doing this for filtering, you've done a very bad job, is case sensitive blocking. Uh, but it's always worth a try. I'm sure people have seen crazier. Uh, and then the last I just show HTML encoding. And in general, um, here are some block listing situations and ways you might get around them. Uh, uh, it's essentially what I've just said. You can see here's our final maybe payload. They can get to be a little funky. And this is what I was afraid to sort of just blast at you all with a PowerPoint presentation your eyes would go cross looking at all of these different types of payloads. There are cheat sheets out there that are thousands of lines long with it, just every iteration of this <laughs> uh, for every character in all different permutations um, that if you wanted to just uh, blast a site with all of the different payloads and see which one worked, you could potentially do that. Um, though I'm sure you would get caught by someone if you did that too much. Block listing. Another uh, fun trick might be to try comments. If space were encapsulated between quotes, and if I enter this payload as is, I'll have a dangling quote at the end. And uh, some browsers might try to fix it, some might not, and throw an error. It all depends on which browser you're using. Um, but we can get around that pretty easily if we throw in a quotes at the end or a comment at the end. Uh, that takes care of the quote, and almost every browser will fix a missing angle bracket, uh, especially, I think, in HTML5, which is, again, super smart and helpful there. OK, well, what if uh, my quotes are escaped? That's kind of a fun filter. I've definitely seen this one in the wild. Uh, it can be frustrating at first. You've got a great payload, and then you realize, oh my gosh, well, it's interpreting those quotes uh, as escaped quotes instead of uh, in the context that I want them to be interpreted. Uh, well, as uh, the name before gave away, what if we already pre-escaped those quotes? Uh, we're escaping the escape. It goes through the process anyway. It escape, escapes each one of those quotes, and we get double escaped quotes, which go through as hard quotes and are processed the way we want them to be. Kind of a fun trick. So with all these uh, tactics, all of these will come into play with reflections, which are uh, one of my favorite methods 
uh, for cross-site scripting. A reflection is just any case where your user input is reflected more than one page, more than one time in the page. So in this case, uh, we have variable A and the variable B both being assigned to the user input. It's sort of nonsensical, but in this case, bear with me. I've definitely seen it where they end up just in two completely different uh, sites of the page, um, but this should still work. Um, so what do we do here? I could try and throw in an alert box. Uh, that's not going to work. I can do an alert box and escape the quote. Uh, that might be kind of interesting. If I escape the quote then here, the script thinks I'm assigning the value of A now to this entire area in red. So I've sort of done my own escaping here to have the script disregard its own quote and use mine instead. Kind of fun. The problem in this case is I still have a lot of trailing junk that won't make a lot of sense and will throw an error to the browser. Uh, so what can I do? Well, I'll just throw in a comment, double backslash, uh, which the first time it comes through in the reflection is ignored because it's part of the variable assignment. And then the second time it's enacted and it comments out the rest of the values. This is where a lot of fun techniques can come in. And I'm hoping we have time and that the demo works to go through this because I think these can be a little crazy. I have one more example here. Um, another variable assignment. Anytime you see the three dots, by the way, that's where our input is going. It's going into both A and B. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to start with an alert box. Uh, now we've got some squiggly brackets we need to account for. But really, it's just like peeling an onion. You just got to work your way backwards. Uh, and what we end up with is a payload that looks like this, which is uh, I started with the alert. I did the comments. I did the backslash. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I had a lot of trailing uh, open brackets that I needed to conquer before I could pop my alert box. So I just threw those in the front, uh, and this works. Are there questions about that? That's kind of a lot. This is a, I was hoping we could walk through one of these, actually, if you don't mind. No, please do. We have plenty of time. Excellent. Uh, so, and this is kind of the fun thing about uh, cross-site scripting, is the JavaScript that you're trying to implant, it's all through the debug window. You can see your payload and see how it worked. Unlike a lot of like SQL injection, which is blind, or you know, uh, OS injection, which is blind, uh, the cool thing about cross-site scripting is it's all done right in front of your eyes. So yeah, we're just going to watch it as we go. This one's an external site. It's that brute logic guy. So if my internet is working. OK. So we have one variable. I've just called it test for now. And we have, we can see here in the debugger, oh my gosh, it's like light gray. We're not going to be able to see it. I can read it out loud. The variable x is being assigned to, and then it's an array where we have a and b. And we have control over the word test in this scenario, uh, but that's all we have control over. So maybe what I'll start with first. Um, do any of you know how a way I can make this bigger? Click into the box showing the code and control plus on your keyboard. Will it not Here you mean? Yeah. yeah, let's try. Oh, Perfect. wonderful. Okay, Just thank like you. Get it to have focus and then that's the way to go. And in fact, that's all we really need to look at here. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I hate to be struggling up here. Okay, so I'm just going to throw in an alert box. And maybe that escape the quote, and we'll just see what that looks like. All right, so now, and I don't have the nice highlighting to take care of it, but I can see A is being assigned up to this point, all of this that's in quotes. 
And now I have what's left over here, the alert box, uh, and then a bunch of junk that I don't know how to take care of. So what I might do is throw in my comments, or yeah, my comments. OK, that's a little better. A is being assigned this junk, my alert box, and then all of this is being commented out. Why isn't it working? You know, one thing that might help is if we go to the console. Wow, it's almost like it's guiding me through this. It's missing a, a curly bracket. OK, well, I know where to put that. Maybe I'll put it right here in front of the alert, which to me makes sense. I have an opening curly bracket here. It's going to want another one here before it starts executing JavaScript. All right, that's still not working. Unexpected token. Well, I don't, I don't get it. I close the curly bracket. Anybody have any ideas what could be the issue here? It's so hard to do this in a live fire. <laughs> so who said semicolon? Yeah, that's it. Uh, we have a variable declaration. And then we're trying to pop an alert box. Those are two separate actions. I don't even need a space. I throw in my semicolon, and now we've got our alert box. So that's kind of fun. It's just, again, working backwards, uh, closing up all the previous JavaScript before you start your new stuff. Awesome. And basically what you're, you're describing here is finding the exploitable input, and then once you've found it, you're going to inject much more nasty JavaScript than you to do something nefarious. Yeah, what, I guess what I'm thinking about here is um, once you've already found that you can insert values, trying to make a way that that'll turn into executing malicious JavaScript, which a lot of times you have to work around the context that your input has been placed in. A good way to check, even if your input's being reflected back at you at all, if it's in a place that this would even be possible, um, is just throw a unique string into every variable assignment uh, when you're visiting a page or doing a pen test. What I like to do is just throw junk through uh, that I can then use as a search string and figure out where that junk ended up in the output. A lot of the variables you send to a website aren't reflected back at all. Um, so the first step, which I didn't cover at all in any of this, is finding where it would even be possible to find cross-site scripting. Then trying to manipulate the environment around that variable in a way that you can execute JavaScript. OK, but Naomi, I have a content security policy. I think I'm pretty safe. Uh, <laughs> CSP is um, one of the, I think it's been around, uh, it had a predecessor, now it's a CSP. A lot of sites are using this to prevent against cross-site scripting. Um, it's actually pretty great in a lot of ways. It will uh, figure out what is legitimate JavaScript code that you want to execute on your server, and in doing so, not allow anything that's not legitimate. Um, and it does this by, you can either safe list origins, so I only want JavaScript that's hosted on my domain to be executed, or in these 10 domains. I'm not sure you can get that granular with it. Um, or, you know, only inline JavaScript is allowed, things like that. Uh, you also can assign code hashes, so even get more granular. I only want these 10 scripts on my own domain to execute. Um, or you can assign a secret nonce. I've never seen that in live world, but um, I'm sure people are doing it. Um, so getting around this, any inline JavaScript is going to be out. Any of the injections that we've been doing are probably not going to work. There are still ways to get around this. <clears throat> if there's, uh, I guess a lot of it is going to be case dependent. So for this first case, if there is file upload functionality and you find you have control over the content type and you try to upload a JavaScript file, well, now that JavaScript file is hosted on the domain. It's not, the hash won't be part of the safe list. It won't have a secret nonce, but it'll be hosted on the domain. You might have a chance of being able to execute stuff there. Uh, script gadgets is a fancy word for just using what you've already got on the page. So taking a look at like the jQuery or the other types of JavaScript packages that are being used on the site and weaponizing that against the site itself. 
uh, you don't need to rewrite the wheel necessarily. You should be able to use their own code against them. Uh, and then JSONP, there's just a lot of articles about this uh, when you look at CSP bypass. Um, and I, I guess I would need a developer to tell me more about it. I looked into it a little, but it's a way of sending JSON. The P is for padding, but it sends it uh, in script tags for some reason, sending JSON in JavaScript tags. Uh, so there's a way to embed uh, malicious JavaScript using that. Um, I do think CSP is good. The situations I've encountered where CSP does not work is when it's being used alone to filter, to prevent against malicious JavaScript being executed. Uh, I think it should just be used in addition to the controls you already have in place. And then just generic tips and tricks that I couldn't really find a place to put into any one of these. Um, HTML tags take priority over JavaScript when the browser is building that DOM. So uh, it, you can try to close scripts early, uh, and your HTML parser won't yell at you. Uh, it's only when the JavaScript parser comes through after the fact that things are going to break. So you may be able to squeeze in your uh, cross-site scripting on the HTML side in your own HTML entity, as opposed to uh, inline JavaScript. So uh, in general, this JavaScript statement doesn't make any sense. It will throw an error. But your work is already done here. Uh, and then I guess the rest of these uh, quote or bullet points are just to say every browser is different. They could have made them all the same, but they chose not to. They all have different DOM parsers, uh, interpreters. Um, some will be friendly and fix your quote mistakes, fix your uh, angle bracket mistakes, and some won't. So I recommend just trying things on a lot of different browsers uh, and see what works. OK. What can you do with cross-site scripting? Uh, we just popped a bunch of alert boxes. And I said in the description that we weren't just going to do alert boxes. So now is where we get to the sort of fun stuff. Uh, I like cross-site scripting because really the limit in a lot of ways is your own imagination. Uh, here's a list of some things you can do. What cross-site scripting gives you is the gateway to the browser. Uh, and anything that's on the page that the user is viewing, for the most part, can be edited. So uh, the first thing we'll talk about is website defacement. I, these are just some silly examples. If you wanted code to look at that actually show defacing a site that you can input, change the background color, insert a bunch of JPEGs. I think I've seen examples where people change all the JPEGs to pictures of kitties or something like that. Um, but really, this could be used uh, more nefariously uh, with uh, putting your uh, hacktivism message up on the site and defacing it for any user of the site. You could spread fake news in a very subtle way by changing, you know, uh, titles of articles or things like that. Like.